Well, hey, hey, good morning, chemistry team. Let's continue looking at our topics of solubility of solutes, right? What determines that in solution? We looked at solids already. In solids, we looked at the identity. Obviously, you know, the more similar the intermolecular forces, the more soluble between the solute and the solvent, like dissolves like. And then we looked at temperature. And as we increase temperature, we saw the majority of solids. In my class, we just always assume the solid will uh, dissolve more at a higher temperature. So solubility increases for solids. For gases, <laughs> it's a wee bit different for temperature. And then we have to add in a third factor, uh, pressure, right? Because gases are greatly influenced by pressure. Solids, eh, right? So let's take a look at the three main factors that affect gas solute solubility, carbon dioxide, oxygen gas, nitrogen gas, those kinds of things, right? Identity, of course, is always number one. How similar are the intermolecular forces? So if I have a solvent like water and it's polar, polar gases will dissolve them already. Now, uh, we are not talking about gases that react with water, all right? So um, if, if, if a gas comes in and actually chemically reacts with water, it's a whole other ballgame. Technically, carbon dioxide can do that, so it gets a little tricky. Um, so we're going to focus more on gases that are non-reactive, oxygen gas, nitrogen gas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the more similar their intermolecular forces, a polar gas is going to be more soluble in polar water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A nonpolar gas would be more soluble in a nonpolar solvent. So like dissolves like. We've already covered all of that stuff. So always look at the identities first. That's going to be one of your major factors. And, you know, assuming a constant temperature, constant pressure. But now if we look at temperature, what if we have a solution at 20 degrees Celsius versus one at 50 degrees Celsius? And it's the same solute under the same pressure. Oh, okay. The only differing factor is the temperature. So what happens? And again, you're increasing the thermal energy, the kinetic energy. Uh, solvent particles are moving faster. Solute particles are moving faster. Um, so for solids, we talked about that breaks up the intermolecular forces, easier to disrupt them, easier to dissolve. But see, for gases, those gases are moving around. Usually it's individual particles moving through the, sol through the solvent, okay? Like, you know, nitrogen gas through water. They're moving around. Nitrogen gas is nonpolar. Oxygen gas is nonpolar. They don't like to be in water, but remember, you've got... Um, the dipole and the water can induce dipoles on the nonpolar so, uh, solutes. So oxygen and nitrogen, even though they're nonpolar, right? Opposite polarities, some will dissolve. There's there's enough dissolved oxygen in lakes and things like that where uh, fish can survive, right? Humans can survive for a short period of time. <laughs> you know, you ever you ever gone swimming or something like that and breathe, uh, breathe in water? Right? You don't drown immediately. You're like, oh, it's highly unpleasant. This happened to me when I was attempting my first snorkeling trip ever. Well, it wasn't a trip. I was with some friends on a. We were flying back home uh, from a choir trip over uh, in China and Japan, things like that. And we had a, a, you know, we stopped at the uh, airport in Hawaii. It was like a three-hour layover, and uh, me and two of my friends accidentally forgot to get on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> to go back home. So we accidentally got stuck in Hawaii for a week. Oh, that was a bummer. <laughs> Good times, right? But I tried snorkeling for the first time. And, uh, you know, I'm not a swimmer. I'm a sprinter, <laughs> not a swimmer. And I got, uh, somehow I ended up outside this coral uh, formation or something like that. Like I said, I don't know water, but the, the waves, I was stuck here. The coral was here and the waves were going boom, boom, boom and smashing. It was a highly unpleasant day. One of the most unpleasant days of my life. And there was this weird thing with the water that was pulling me down. So I was, I was inhaling water. Um, was that, was I drowning? I don't know, but my friend had to fish me out. <laughs> it was a bad day. So I proved you can breathe water and still live for a short period of time. You don't breathe water and go, ah, because there's some oxygen in it where you can survive for a small period of time, right? So I'm not a biology guy, but obviously fish can do that for an indefinite period of time if there's enough oxygen. But as you increase the temperature, the oxygen molecules are moving around faster. They've got more kinetic energy, and it's easier for them to go boop and pop out of the solution, right? So as you increase the temperature, in general, the solubility of gases will decrease. It's opposite of the solids, right? It's a little tricky. 
Um, now there's a few gases that, that are a little wackadoo and don't follow that. So for my class, this is going to be the case where all the gases we look at, you increase the temperature, uh, you decrease the solubility of the gas. This happens in lab a lot where uh, you'll get uh, colder water from a tap, especially our deionized water tap. And some people will take, they'll have a bottle of DI water that's room temperature, but it's almost empty. So they'll fill it up with some straight from the tap, which is a little colder than room temperature. So there's more dissolved air in there, more dissolved nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, and then they'll put it in the, their burette. And we have these little uh, more burettes, MOHR burettes with these plastic tubes. And as the water goes in there, that water, the colder water starts to warm up to room temperature. And you see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tiny little bubbles forming inside the burette tubing. And they're like, what are all those bubbles? And it messes up the volume measurement. I go, oh, that's uh, dissolved air escaping from the water as it's warming up to room temperature. Oh, whoopsie. <laughs> that's why you got to use room temperature water for that. Or if you're heating up a pot of water, even though it's not even close to boiling, you'll see a lot of little bubbles coming in. Well, that's escaping oxygen and nitrogen gas um, from the dissolved air. Kind of cool, right? As you heat it up. Uh, and again, it's just because those the solute, you can think of it simply as the solute gases are moving faster, boop, 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 popping out easier. So uh, think about lakes and things like that. Um, there's some fish that maybe are adapted to survive at a certain temperature, but if, if it gets abnormally warm and that decreases the solubility of the oxygen gas in the lake, is it possible it could warm up enough where there's not enough dissolved oxygen for some of the fish to survive? I guess it would be fish specific. Not a biology person, but hey, something to think about. If you are a biology person, maybe that's something you've run into in a class going, oh, interesting, you know, an abnormally warm lake and you get, you know, kills off some of the aquatic life. Makes sense to a chemist who goes, oh, there's less dissolved oxygen in there. Totally makes sense. Well, there's some other factors involved in here because um, it's a gas. So we need to look at pressure. Let's take a look at that. Oh, another one is um, you probably run into in everyday life is if you drink soda pop. I was a Mountain Dew guy for, well, I have to say, I can't say was. It's been a love-hate relationship for a long time, <laughs> decades and decades and decades. I'm currently Mountain Dew free, but we'll see how long that lasts. But there'll be sometimes we'll have a Mountain Dew. I have a long commute. Well, I won't drink. I'll, you know, have a bottle and you hear that, you know, you go, stop that sound. And I'll drink it and it's got the bubbles and the caffeine and all that kind of stuff. But I don't finish it. Um, with, with a bottle, it, it's not as big of a factor. But if I have a can, right, pop it open and I don't drink it all, I'll leave it in my car. I'm in Southern California. It gets pretty warm. I'll go teach for, you know, four, five, six hours. <laughs> <laughs> that soda pop can's just cooking, right? Uh, and then I'll come out and I'm done. And uh, and I got that long drive home and I'm driving home and I'm like, oh, you know, starting to nod off. I need my caffeine. And I'll look at that, you know, maybe a quarter left of the Mountain Dew in the can that's been cooking in a hundred degree Fahrenheit <laughs> Southern California heat for six hours. And I'll pick it up and drink it. And there's no carbonation left. That, all that carbon dioxide has left because it's such a higher temperature. The gas is able to escape. But you're still like, it's still better than water. Oh, no, no. <laughs> the good old days, right? <laughs> Let's look at So more important than temperature will be the pressure effect. Let's take a look at pressure effects. All right, much more impactful on gas solute solubility is the pressure, right? Temperature is a big one, but pressure is huge with gas particles, not so much on solids and liquids and stuff. All right, so what was found, and hopefully this makes sense, okay? So let's say we've got a solution, you know, maybe it's a sealed container or something in equilibrium with its vapor above it, okay? And there'll be some of the dissolved gas solute in the vapor above it and in the solution itself in some equilibrium, like when we talked about vapor pressure. Well, if you increase the partial pressure of the gas above the solution, more gas particles are striking the surface of the solution and are more likely to go into solution. Make sense? Just physically. Okay, you have physically more gas solute particles striking the surface of the solvent, and it's going and more a per higher percentage will be absorbed into the solution, right? So as you increase the partial pressure of the gas solute above the solution, more particles will go in, and therefore the solubility will increase, i.e., the concentration or the amount of gas dissolved in the solution also goes up. Just Think of it, just, to me, that just makes sense. You just push more in there, right? Now, how you alter that partial pressure 
right? Uh, the con you can think of the concentration uh, is equivalent to the partial pressure, just a number of molecules of gas per, say, milliliter uh, uh, volume or something like that. Um, so you could, you know, just increase the number of gas particles by adding more into the gas phase, more will go into the solution. Uh, or you could change volume, Boyle's law, right? So if I decrease the pressure above the, I'm not the pressure, decrease the volume above the solution, that increases the particle density uh, in the gas phase. So you've increased the partial pressure, right? Decrease volume, increase pressure. Ha ha ha, Boyle's law. So that means more particles are going to go into the solution phase. So this was mathematically looked at by uh, William Henry early, I don't know the exact date, early 1800s, a long time ago. Of course, they always name it after themselves, Henry's Law, <laughs> right? Um, looking at, obviously, hopefully it makes sense to you, the concentration of gas in the solution is proportional to the partial pressure of the gas in the vapor phase above it. To make that proportionality and equivalency, we need a proportionality constant. So we could say the concentration of the gas, and I'm just going to go C, that's the concentration of the gas in the solution, will be equal to some proportionality constant, right? Sometimes you'll see A, B, whatever. We did this for some of the simple gas laws. It will be some constant K times the partial pressure of that gas. So that's what's known as Henry's Law. We're going to look at that for changing conditions. What if you change the pressure? Um, how can you determine the concentration? And again, K is Henry's law constant. And you'll see this a lot with proportionalities. To make that an equality, you need a proportionality constant or Henry's constant. And again, partial pressure of the gas, concentration of the gas in the solution, Henry's law constant. Um, and that would be just if you have a solution. If you know the concentration and you know the partial pressure above it, you can solve for the Henry's Law constant. can have lots of different units depending on the units of the pressure. Lots of pressure units, bar, atmosphere, tor, pounds per square inch, <laughs> kilopascals, oh my gosh. Concentration units, there's a whole bunch of those. <laughs> you can have molarity, you know, uh, all the other ones we looked at, molality, mole fraction, a whole bunch of things. Uh, but if you know Henry's Law constant, and you know the concentration, you can determine the pressure. So as long as you know two of the three, but typically we don't like working with the constant. So I'm going to uh, flip this around for change of conditions, get rid of the constant, and show you how we can get a better version of Henry's Law for our purpose. All right, let's take a look at Henry's Law for changing conditions. Let's say we alter the external pressure, uh, which alters the partial pressure of the gas. However you do it, maybe change the volume, but the partial pressure of the gas increases or decreases above the solution. Or we... Uh, uh, change the concentration. How does that change the, the partial pressure above it? Let's say we've got some initial conditions here, right? There's Henry's law. Some final conditions here. So we can label these as like, you know, C1P1, C2P2, or CIPI, uh, CFPF. So let's call, you know, state one, the initial state two, the final. So instead of a P sub gas, this, so pressure, I'm going to leave the sub gas up there. That P stands for the partial pressure of the gas. So let's take a look at this. Can we rearrange this? Because that's a constant, right? So what I'm going to do is isolate the constant. So let's call it C1 over P1 equals K, right? So this would be initial conditions, C1, P1. So if I take the concentration divided by the partial pressure by the solution, that will equal Henry's law constant. Won't that also be true here, right? So C2, if that's the fi final conditions, over P2 will also equal K. Well, if C1 over P1 equals K and C2 over P2 equals K, right? You get this with a lot of the, you know, Boyle's Law, Avogadro's Law, uh, Gay-Lussac's Law, Charles' Law, all these things. Therefore... C1 over P1, the initial concentration divided by the initial pressure, must equal C2 over P2. So that's another way of looking at Henry's Law, right? You can always derive it from the original Henry's Law, where the concentration equals uh, Henry's Law constant times the pressure. Um, but we can use this to say, well, let's say we're at sea level, right? And we know some concentration of a gas at sea level. 
what would be the concentration on top of a mountain or below the surface of, so say you're a scuba diver or something like that. How would the pressure change, right? Or how would the concentration change if the pressure changes? So as long as you have three of these four variables, you can solve for the other one. Pretty simple. So let's take a look at a specific application of Henry's Law. It's per, the math isn't too tough, right? Whatever the units are, right? So if you're given some weird unit of concentration and pressure, and you have the same pressure unit, just answer it in that weird unit of concentration. It's okay. Simple math. Let's do one problem. All right. Once you see this, it's not too bad. Like it's a four-variable equation, not too tough, as long as they give you three of the four. So here's an example. So let's say the concentration of nitrogen gas in blood at sea level is about 0.78 atmospheres, approximately. And how did I get that? Well, sea level, let's define that as one atmosphere, and nitrogen is about 78% of the air, right? So 78% of one atmosphere, so that's why I put about 0.78. Oxygen is about 21%, so it would be about 0.21 atmospheres, right? So let's say you're on the surface of a, a boat or something like that, you know, uh, in the ocean. You're like, ah, okay, so, and we're used to that. No big deal. And the concentration at that pressure would be about, I you know, looked around, about 0.488 millimoles of nitrogen for every liter of blood, right? And you'll see this, other, other things is so many like milliliters of nitrogen per liter of blood or molarity or whatever units, right? Doesn't really matter. Well, if the concentration of nitrogen in your blood is 0.488 millimoles of nitrogen per liter of blood at a pressure of 0.78 atmospheres on, at sea level, what would the concentration of nitrogen in your blood be if you went down? You jump off the boat, you go down, you know, whether you're, you know, the, the snorkeling or whatever, or if you some of these amazing, amazing superhumans called free divers. Holy moly. I mean, there's free diving and then there's extreme free diving. Uh, just, you know, some of these uh, spear fishers and stuff. I had a little business associate that was a spear fisher in Hawaii. Uh, and they would just hold their breath and go down 20, 30, 40, 50 feet. And I'm like, whoa! <laughs> you know, because I uh, ruptured my, uh, is it a tympanic membrane? I'm not an, uh, an anatomy guy. Um, so I have issues with my ears now. I mean, if I just go to like, you know, the six feet depth in a swimming pool, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> my ear. I, and I tried, you know, when I tried snorkeling my first time, you know, I'd go down and, and literally you just go down a little bit and you can feel the pressure of the water just push on you. Your, your mask just go, oh, and your ears go, uh, I did scuba diving once. My wife was, you know, went all over the world scuba diving. Um, actually thought about being a professional scuba diver instructor. She's that good. You know, I remember she's, we were on our uh, anniversary, uh, not our, our uh, honeymoon in Hawaii, and, and uh, I'm not a deep water guy, not a shark guy, alligator guy, just horrible way to die. <laughs> Some student of mine, I said that once, and I get this attachment in an email from a student, and it's like, boom, it's a big great white shark's mouth. I'm like, ah! <laughs> it just freaked me out. I loved it. <laughs> but my wife's like, you know, she's like, I, you know, I've been scuba diving all over and haven't seen a shark. Don't worry about it. I'm like, I'm going to get eaten by a shark. I know I'm going to get eaten by a shark, you know, or killed by something with big teeth. And so we, uh, you know, go through, and I understand the chemistry of, you know, breathing the compressed air and nitrox and all that kind of stuff. So off we go. Literally, I'm sinking, you know, and I can, my ears are hurting, and I'm following this little rope going down. I open my eyes, and there's a freaking shark. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. The first thing I see is a shark, you know. My wife tells me it was one of the, the tame, I forget, some kind of reef shark or something like that. But anyway, you know, I just made the ocean a little more yellow at the moment. <laughs> Sorry, I went off on a rabbit hole there. But it was, it was once I didn't panic, I, I went through my uh, my tank faster because I'm like, <laughs> you know, and I'm doing my doggy paddle and stuff. But it was an astounding experience to see that world underneath the surface of the ocean. It was really cool. If you're into that, Wow. Um, but these free divers will go down without a tank. It's, it's astounding. And some of these professional free divers can go way down for six, seven, eight, ten minutes. How do you hold your breath that long? It's astounding. Um, I think the current record, like with a metal sled or something like that, allows them to sink faster and use like you know ways to re uh, to get back out faster is like seven hundred feet. Holy moly! But I think without a sled, it's around five hundred ish feet. There's a lot of different records for this and that and this aid and not that aid and whatever. But let's say this free diver goes <gasps> and holds their breath and literally goes down 
to 500 feet. Holy moly. We're going to talk about some effects of that on the next. It's not really chemistry as much, but um, I think it's about every 33 feet, is it? Every 33 feet, the pressure goes up another atmosphere, pushes on you. So if you get down 33 feet, the pressure that you're experiencing is double what you would feel on the surface. Another 33 feet goes up another atmosphere. Ooh, and you, if you've gone down, you can you you understand that effect. 500 feet down, well, if every 33 feet it goes up another atmosphere, it's around to two. It's like 11.8 atmospheres. Um, for the pressure of nitrogen. So let's just say it's 12 atmospheres way down there, and they sit down there, and we'll, we'll talk about the rapture of the deep in a second. <laughs> I kind of get, get like drunk down there. It's kind of cool. Well, let's calculate using Henry's law what would the concentration of the nitrogen gas be in this freediver's blood at a depth of 500 feet if they sit down there for a while. Well, we know under changing conditions, C1 over P1 is C2 over P2, correct? Well, we know C1, that's 0.488 millimoles nitrogen per liter of blood. We know P1, which is 0.78 atmosphere. We know P2, which is 12 atmospheres. So let's solve for C2. Okay, it shouldn't be so, so tough. So C2, remember algebra, uh, that'll be C1 times P2 over P1. Did I do my algebra right? Just multiply both sides by, by P2, cancels out. So what's C1? 0.488. I'm just going to go millimoles per liter, understanding that's millimoles of nitrogen per liter of blood. Let's multiply that by the, uh, the higher pressure as you go down, 12 atmospheres. And I could have done those pressure units and, you know, any pressure unit doesn't matter. As long as the pressure units are the same, they'll cancel out. The P P1 was 0.78. Let's write that down there. So really easy math, but there's some fun applications of this. So we can cancel out atmospheres. So whatever they are, now if those are different units, you'll have to convert them into the same unit. If this was tor, I'd have to convert the atmosphere to tor or the tor to atmosphere, right? I'm just going to leave the concentration units like that. Why change it? All right. So we got two sig figs, two sig figs, because I approximated those, three there. So we're going to be limited to two significant digits. So let's punch this out. 0.488 times 12 equals, divided by 0.78 equals, I get 7.50769, blah, 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 and it goes on. So C2 will be 7.5, there's my two sig figs, 07, and so that'll round uh, to 7.5, that'll be millimoles, Per liter, and if I round that, that'll be 7.5 millimoles of nitrogen per liter of blood. That's a lot of dissolved inert gas in your blood. Let's have a fun little segue and talk about the rapture of the deep, the bends, some interesting uh, ramifications that you may have experienced. I didn't experience the bends. I just experienced panic and scuba diving, seeing shark, <laughs> right? But I didn't, I don't think I went down farther than 20 feet. But boy, you go deeper than that, you can start feeling some stuff. Let's just have some fun after this to finish up the video. Fun application number one. And if you're bored on a you know Saturday night or something, you can you know uh, do internet searches and have some fun with these things. The, I just love the sound of this, the rapture of the deep. Rapture, just kind of a cool sounding word. The rapture of the deep. That's the uh, the fun term for nitrogen narcosis or just the narcosis effect. So imagine you go down, you know, however far you go. We did our example at 500 feet. Well, you're increasing the concentration of dissolved gases in your blood, like nitrogen, right? Um that starts to work as an anesthetic, right? It can start to impact your, your nervous system and whatnot. A lot like being drunk, right? The narcosis, narcotics, you know, all that fun stuff. So the terminology is great. So if you're on top of your boat where the price pressure nitrogen is about 0.78 atmospheres, blah, 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 you know, maybe I would recommend, you know, if you're going down, have a line to hold on to. <laughs> and you go way down and you're sitting there at 500. Don't try this, please. People have died doing this, <laughs> right? It's kind of like, a, I don't know, like you think of these free climbers and things like that. 
Um, and motorcycle riders, I had a, a friend who's a motorcycle rider and he goes, it's a, not a matter of if you wreck, it's a matter of when you wreck. So I would imagine there, I, I wonder, I'm not a rock climber or anything, mountain climber free, you know, freestyle, but you just hear all these horrible stories, you know, that, you know, no matter how good you are, it just takes one little slip. Is it a matter of when and not if? Same with these free divers way down here. Is it a matter of when and not if? I don't know. All right. I'm not any of those. <laughs> okay. So, um, but there's a fun little thing people call it. I've heard it say the martini effect. I'm not a martini guy, but about every 33 feet down you go, it would be like drinking a martini. <laughs> All right. So 33, yeah, no big deal. But if you're down 500 feet, 500, whoops, 500 divided by 33, that'd be about 15 martinis. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, yeah, you're, I, I think your judgment might be a little bit impaired. And when you're that far down and your judgment's impaired, that is a matter of life and death. So that's why there's only a few people on the planet, highly trained professionals with the incredible ability to hold their breath for many, many, many minutes. Try holding your breath for one minute, right? Most people can't even do that. Try for eight or 10 minutes. What? I don't know what the record is for holding breath. I should have looked that up, but I know some people have gotten, you know, three, four, 500 feet, 600 feet down. Unbelievable. Now, the next thing we have to worry about is the bends, because if you're down here and you've got all this dissolved nitrogen in your blood, if you try to resurface, say, for example, you're like me, and you're like going, shark, blah, <laughs> you see a shark and you're like, blah, blah, get up as fast as you can. Your body is going to have some serious issues because you're changing the solubility of the gas at such a rapid rate. You can start to get bubbles of gas coming out of your bloodstream and causing some severe effects in your body. Let's take a look at the bends next. Fun stuff. And have you ever had the bends? <laughs> right? So if you're a scuba diver or a free diver or anything like that, again, if you go down uh, and the pressure is increasing greatly, greatly you're, you're increasing the amount of dissolved inner gas, probably nitrogen, uh, if you're using some kind of nitrox, right, as a diver. where Because if you're just doing regular air, which is 78% nitrogen, as you go down, that, that's a lot of nitrogen in your blood. So a lot of times they'll use uh, uh, nitrox, which has a higher oxygen percentage and a lower nitrogen percentage. Uh, you can go up to like, you know, 32, 36% oxygen, which decreases the nitrogen. So there's less nitrogen dissolved in your blood. But even with that, if you go down far enough and you resurface too quickly, like me seeing the shark, ah! and I go up too fast, the pressure's rapidly decreasing, right? If you're going up as fast, or if you're a free diver and, and you pad, maybe you have, you know, a rapture of the deep and you're not thinking right and you're like, oh, I need to get up fast and boom, you know, you inflate a balloon and shoot up. You're, you're massively decreasing the pressure. Well, if you're decreasing the pressure, you're decreasing the concentration or the solubility of that nitrogen gas in your blood to the point where you can get bubbles of it bubbling out of your bloodstream. Weird or other body fluids. Oh no, that can impair the nervous system and have other effects like that. Never felt it myself, but I've heard it can be very painful. Imagine that. Oh, just like, ugh, can cause paralysis. Not good when a shark's chasing you. <laughs> my wife keeps saying, and my daughter, she's the biology person. She, you know, just turned 11. She's like, sharks aren't going to hurt you. You're totally safe with sharks. I'm like, I saw Jaws. I saw Orca the Killer Whale. I know what's going on. Death possibility. That would be bad when you're underwater free diving. <laughs> that would equal to this. It's just the crazy effect. So you need to resurface slowly so you're not having this rapid release of this inner gas or nitrogen bubbles out of your bloodstream. Um, or use a decompression chamber or something. I've never had to use a decompression chamber, fortunately. Um, another way to reduce this uh, is to not use nitrox, a nitrogen-oxygen mixture, even with the reduced nitrogen. Use, um, I think it's heliox or something, if you're, uh, correct me, if you're a scuba diver, um, where instead of nitrogen, you use a helium. You don't want pure oxygen, right? I mean, dealing with that, can you imagine the flammability issues? Um, but if you use helium instead of nitrogen, do a mixture of helium uh, and oxygen. Helium's kind of odd as a gas work, as it doesn't cause this narcosis effect um, or uh, the bends or anything like that. It's kind of weird. Uh, I think it's helium. Um, so heliox, yeah. So that would help prevent that. 
or, or reduce that effect. But, you know, check it out if this is something. I'm not going to test you on this, but uh, it's just kind of a fun little side effect there. And, and if you're into scuba diving, you can look up nitrox and decompression sickness and rapture of the deep in the bends. And you can look at it from a chemistry perspective going, oh, you're increasing the pressure as you go down, increases the concentration of that gas, right? And if you go up too fast, it can start bubbling out at too rapid a rate, impairing different functions of your body. Weird. There's one more fun one. I'm not going to go into too much depth, but another fun one if you're bored on a Saturday night and want to learn some really crazy stuff. All right, if you want to learn some applied chemistry, but this one's for a horrific tragedy, Lake Niles tragedy in Cameroon. I think it was 1986. Um, so I'll draw this in a second. So imagine you've got a, a, a like an, an old volcano when you've got this super deep crater in it where a lake is formed, Lake Niles. Well, at the bottom, there's high pressure, colder temperatures, so you have a high solubility of gases. And there's a source of carbon dioxide from, like, uh, I think magma deep below or something like that. I don't know the geology of it. But carbon dioxide's bubbling in at the bottom of the lake, and you've got really, really high, probably even super saturated carbon dioxide levels at the bottom of the lake. Well, what if there's some event, I don't know what the event is, an earthquake, a landslide, um, some volcanic ability, you know, some, something happens that causes that deeper, uh, you know, sat highly saturated CO2 levels of the lake flip, like taking a soda pop uh, bottle and going, chuka, 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 pss, pss, <laughs> and blows out, right? And, and it flips up to this uh, higher temperature, lower pressure top. That carbon dioxide, the solubility decreases so rapidly in this huge lake that you get this massive cloud of carbon dioxide burst out the top. And since CO2 is more dense, Right, it started, it went up and then started coming down and went down the sides of the mountain, displacing oxygen. So, if people were sleeping, livestock there, whatever, everyone within 16 miles and all livestock suffocated to death. It was horrific. Let's do a quick drawing of that. But uh, the, the, ke the chemistry is fascinating, but the application was horrific. My Pictionary skills are sorely lacking, as you can tell, but Pictionary is a game of the mind. It's a psychic connection, right? You don't have to draw well as long as you have that psychic connection with your partner. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Arizona, blah, blah, blah. Statue of Liberty. You do the same thing twice. How did you get that? <laughs> so imagine you've got this old volcano and you've got this super deep lake, right? And definitely uh, you do some internet stuff on this. It's, it's amazing. So obviously at the bottom of the lake, you're at really high pressure, higher solubility of gases, lower temperature, higher solubility. I mean, lower solubility of gases in that one. Um, but it's mostly the pressure effect here. Um, but we've got the source of CO2, right? So you've got under the super high pressure, um, we, we've got this, this high, I mean, I don't know if it's super saturated, maybe even super saturated amount of CO2 with the little red dots in there. So, yeah, yeah, higher pressure, lower temperature. So both, uh, you know, enhancing the solubility effect on it. Well, up towards the top of the lake, you get the sun hitting in. It's a higher temperature, right? Lower solubility gases, lower pressure, lower solubility gases. So you got much less carbon dioxide in there. And that's, you know, t it's an unstable situation, you know, but as long as this isn't shifting, the water's not moving around, you're going to be okay. But what if something happened? Earthquake! I don't know what caused it, right? that causes this to flip up, right? What if that water came up here real fast, like you're shaking the soda pot, right? Really mundane explanation of this. But now you've got this super saturated situation and the CO2 just erupts out. You get this massive release of carbon dioxide. Well, carbon dioxide, as it shoots up, it's more dense than air. So what happens, is that CO2 cloud moves down the mountainside. And if you've got a village here with livestock and people and stuff, and that comes down, right? You can't see or smell CO2, right? What if this happened at night and everybody was sleeping? I don't know what time of day this happened, but that could suffocate everybody. And it was, I think it was within 16 miles. Horrible, 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 but fascinating. And again, I don't have all the details on it, but it gives you a general idea of, as the chemist Right, you can do the solubilities of the gases and kind of understand the basics of the process. I went on way too long, but this is a fun topic for me. So, um, we're done with solubility gases. Let's move on to uh, vapor pressures of solutions next.